classical sense, according to the Royal Family website. Just earlier here in 2022, Queen Elizabeth II said Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, would take the title Queen Consort when Prince Charles does become king. We would heard that earlier here today. I do want to just bring up that remarks uh, and also the statement from uh, the king himself from just earlier here today. This is a statement from His Majesty the king uh, so you can again see it up on your screen uh, so this is uh, the latest statement coming from the king who's going to have a lot of duties ahead of him in these next days that are coming but let's go ahead and read it back out here for you today as uh, again we're just uh, learning a little bit more each and every single time we're bringing you these updates so uh, the royal family putting this out uh, this is a statement from his majesty the king at the time of the queen's death saying the death of my beloved mother her majesty the queen is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all family and members of my family we mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much loved mother i know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country the realms and the commonwealth wealth and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the queen was so widely held. So this again, just coming out here today on Thursday, September 8th, a date that will live in the memory of many people as the day of uh, a great loss in t across the entire country, the day they lost Queen Elizabeth Elizabeth II. And of course, we want to always uh, take a look back at how we got to this point here today. Uh, going to be taking you through a timeline and giving you more details on the Queen's reign as uh, we go into a, a story, taking a look back at the Queen's life with our very own Fox's Martha McCallum. Was born into the Royal Windsor family on April 21, 1926. At birth, as the oldest daughter of the Duke and Duchess of York and niece to the king, no one expected that little Elizabeth, Alexandra Mary, would one day be the longest serving and one of the most respected rulers of Great Britain. But a love story would transform her quiet country childhood into an altogether different destiny. When Elizabeth's uncle, Prince Edward, abdicated as king to marry the American divorcee, Wallace Simpson. Elizabeth's father reluctantly took the throne, becoming King George VI in 1936, making his oldest and then 10-year-old daughter Elizabeth his heir to the throne. At age 14, the homeschooled princess began to take on some royal duties. Her family was an outward expression of strength and resilience as England was battered by the Blitz in World War II. In 1945, at age 18, the young princess trained as a driver and mechanic in the Women's Auxiliary Service. She and her sister Margaret later joined those celebrating VE Day on the streets of London. Like thousands of others, she also had a sweetheart in the armed forces, her third cousin, Prince Philip of Greece. They were engaged to be married shortly after the princess's 21st birthday. The royal wedding held November of 1947 in London's Westminster Abbey. It brightened the gloom of those post-war years. The following year, the couple's first child, Charles, the Prince of Wales, was born. He was then followed by Princess Anne in 1950, Andrew in 1959, and Edward in 1963. But in 1952, while in Kenya with Prince Philip, Elizabeth learned the tragic news that her beloved father, the king, had died. In an instant, the 25-year-old became the Queen of England. At my coronation, I shall dedicate myself anew to your service. Elizabeth was to rule in a new era. Her coronation, in all its splendor, was the first to be broadcast on television as millions around the globe watched the transformation as it happened. In 1957, Queen Elizabeth met President Eisenhower. She would go on to meet every U.S. president during her reign, except Lyndon Johnson. She often spoke of the strong and vital bond between America and the U.K. But with the 1990s came turbulent times for the royal family, as the marriages of three of the Queen's children fell apart all under the scrutiny of relentless TV coverage and tabloid headlines. 
Then, in 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales and mother to the princes William and Harry, was killed in a car crash in France as she was hounded by the paparazzi. At the time, the Queen was criticized for her reserved response and persuaded to make an unprecedented live broadcast. So what I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. Over time, the monarchy's reputation rebounded. In April of 2011, the Queen attended Prince William's wedding to Kate Middleton, as some two billion people around the world watched the ceremony. She also made a historic visit to the Republic of Ireland, the first British monarch to do so in almost a century, a step toward healing a long and painful divide. The following year, the country turned out in force to celebrate Queen Elizabeth's 60-year reign, a diamond jubilee celebration spanning four days. Thousands lined the banks of the Thames as a flotilla of a thousand boats, led by the Queen, made its way down the river. The worst of British weather tried but failed to dampen the mood. And the then 86-year-old Queen and 90-year-old Prince Philip stood side by side for the four-hour ceremony. Queen Elizabeth ended the celebrations by thanking the nation for honoring her. I will continue to treasure and draw inspiration from the countless kindnesses shown to me in this country and throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you all. In 2013, the Queen welcomed her third great-grandchild, the much-anticipated Prince George, son of William and Kate. Now, all these years later, another George is now second in line to the British throne. His younger sister, Princess Charlotte, is third. She was born in 2015, and later that year, Queen Elizabeth became Britain's longest reigning monarch, overtaking her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. In 2016, the Queen celebrated her 90th birthday. That was a four-day event, honoring the Queen's deep involvement with the armed forces and giving the nation a chance to celebrate her life. 2018, the Queen watched on as grandson Prince Harry married the American actress Meghan Markle in a ceremony that brought glamour and Hollywood royalty to the House of Windsor and led them firmly into the 21st century. But about a year later, Harry and Meghan would famously decide to leave the royal family, move to America, and give a tell-all interview to Oprah Winfrey, which caused deep divisions within the family. In 2021, the Queen's beloved husband, Prince Philip, died at the age of 99. The nation mourned with the Queen, but COVID restrictions kept the funeral small. The image of the Queen sitting masked and alone in the church became the image of a country both in mourning and in lockdown. But as she had so many times before, the Queen persevered. From an early age, Queen Elizabeth was one of the most recognized royals and recognized women in the world. Nearly a third of the planet lived in the Commonwealth that she ruled. She managed to combine the truly regal with a countrywoman's simple pleasures, and she embodied old-fashioned values of virtue, faith, and self-restraint, honoring to the very end the pledge she had made when she was just 21. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Back out live here in Scotland, uh, where we do know this is the place uh, where Queen Elizabeth took her final breaths after uh, visiting with some immediate family members. She did pass away peacefully. And uh, just moments ago, we did have uh, the UK Prime Minister, Liz Truss. She came out and made a few short remarks. Let's go ahead, listen into uh, what she had to say just from a little bit earlier here this afternoon. We are all devastated by the news that we have just heard from Balmoral. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. 
our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. Her, her life of service stretched beyond most of our living memories. In return, she was loved and admired by the people in the United Kingdom and all around the world. She has been a personal inspiration to me and to many Britons. Her devotion to duty is an example to us all. Earlier this week, at 96, she remained determined to carry out her duties as she appointed me as her 15th Prime Minister. Throughout her life, she's visited more than 100 countries and she has touched the lives of millions around the world. In the difficult days ahead, we will come together with our friends across the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and the world to celebrate her extraordinary lifetime of service. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today, the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty, King Charles III. With the King's family, we mourn the loss of his mother. And as we mourn, we must come together as a people to support him, to help him bear the awesome responsibility that he now carries for us all. We offer him our loyalty and devotion, just as his mother devoted so much to so many for so long. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. Those remarks just coming in a little bit earlier here today as uh, the British Prime Minister Liz Truss stepped out. Uh, again, she was one of those very first people who had gotten the news about uh, the Queen's death. And we do want to continue bringing you more reaction. Just a few moments ago, we did have uh, our Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. He stepped out. Let's go ahead and bring those remarks to you from the beginning right here on Live Now from Fox. It is with the deepest of sorrow that we learn today of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She was our queen for almost half of Canada's existence, and she had an obvious, deep, and abiding love and affection for Canadians. She served us all with strength and wisdom for 70 years as we grew into the diverse, optimistic, responsible, ambitious and extraordinary country we are today. As her 12th Canadian Prime Minister, I'm having trouble believing that my last sit down with her was my last. I will so miss those chats. She was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful, funny, and so much more. In a complicated world, her steady grace and resolve brought comfort and strength to us all. Canada is in mourning. She was one of my favorite people in the world, and I will miss her so.
c'est avec une grande tristesse que nous apprenons aujourd'hui du décès de Sa Majesté la Reine Élisabeth II. Elle était notre reine pendant presque la moitié de l'existence du Canada et elle avait une affection évidente et profonde pour tous les Canadiens. Elle nous a servi avec force et courage pendant 70 ans, pendant que nous sommes devenus le pays ambitieux, optimiste, diversifié, responsable, extraordinaire que nous sommes aujourd'hui. En tant que sa douzième premier ministre canadien, j'ai beaucoup de mal à accepter que la dernière fois que je l'ai vu sera la dernière fois. Ces conversations vont me manquer énormément. Elle était intéressée, intéressante, engagée, curieuse, drôle. Elle m'a beaucoup conseillé, beaucoup aidé. Dans un monde très compliqué, sa présence, sa grâce, sa force a été une ressource importante pour nous tous. C'était une de mes personnes préférées au monde et elle me manquera énormément. All right, so uh, there you have it, Justin Trudeau also giving his remarks on the Queen's death. And I know that a lot of uh, more uh, condolences are only going to be coming in from around the world as she did have an impact, not just uh, for her own country, but for many other countries that they had partnerships with. Um, I do want to continue to give you more live coverage right here on Live Now from Fox. We've thrown out our breaks. We're going to continue talking about uh, Queen Elizabeth II, who reigned for 70 years years uh, bringing in also live now from Fox's Andrew Kraft here with us and Andrew I know we already spoke on the phone this morning but uh, there was a lot of people who were hoping that maybe when they said she was having some medical issues here today that she would pull through again because we have seen that uh, in a time or two before. No, Christy, that is, that is so right you know a lot of people knew this was coming and yet they still probably cannot believe uh, the news that they are witnessing right now. Of course, she was 96 years old. Uh, this was a long time coming. There have been so many preparations in place for the death of the monarch this day, September 8th. Uh, the day is finally here, uh, and so many uh, are in mourning right now, especially there in the UK. Uh, but so many are probably thinking that they got to celebrate uh, and spend earlier this summer those jubilee celebrations uh, as the monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, celebrated 70 years on the throne, the longest reigning British monarch uh, in its history. And so uh, a lot of people are probably uh, asking, what is next? What is going to happen? So Prince Charles immediately becomes King Charles, though later on, we don't know when, there's going to have to be some type of coronation ceremony, much like Queen Elizabeth had when her father died back in 1952. She acceded to the throne almost immediately. She was only, what, 25, 26 years old at the time and has now spent her life in public service, in duty to not only the country, uh, but also to the Commonwealth, which was then at the time in the 1950s, uh, much, much larger than it is today. It has weakened dramatically uh, and it has, um, you know, essentially she has overseen really uh, the dissolution and the breakup of the large, large British Empire. Uh, and so still, uh, and I, I know I was talking to you about this earlier this morning when the news broke, she was doing her official duties just three days ago. We just heard from uh, the new British Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Uh, she welcomed Liz Truss at Balmoral in Scotland on Monday. Uh, and, and kind of that is the official and customary tradition where the, the monarch greets the new prime minister. She's done it, what, 14, 15, 16 times? Winston Churchill was her first prime minister, one of the greatest British prime ministers uh, in the 20th century, uh, really. Uh, and so uh, I, I've been making so many of these historic parallels that we have seen today, uh, where uh, at the throne, when she exceeded back in 1952, Winston Churchill was then prime minister. Winston Churchill was born in the 1870s when Queen Victoria was on the throne, her great-great-grandmother. 
Uh, and so uh, there's so many historical lines that we're going to be teasing out. And you can see there the throngs of crowds gathering outside of Buckingham Palace today. Uh, the news that so many knew were coming, but still so many didn't want to confront, no doubt, but they have to. Uh, and so we're going to be seeing so many celebrations uh, of her life, uh, of her legacy. Uh, she has been a ubiquitous fixture uh, in so many uh, lives, uh, especially since, you know, a lot of people we've talked to in Britain for events like the Jubilee, like the funeral of her, her husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, that they haven't known a life without Queen Elizabeth II. They, she has been in the background for so long. Okay, we're going to be joined by some guests right now. We have Saad Selman, uh, who is joining us via Zoom, uh, and he is live outside of Buckingham Palace right now. He runs the Royal Watcher blog. Saad, we just spoke to you last week on the occasion of the 24th, uh, 25th rather anniversary of the death of Princess Diana. Now we know Queen Elizabeth II passing away peacefully today at Balmoral in Scotland, surrounded by her family. What is the atmosphere like outside of Buckingham Palace? Uh, announcement was so sudden. Um, I was at Buckingham Palace earlier this morning to attend the um, Okay, so we're experiencing just some technical difficulties there. Uh, Saad is joining us uh, across the pond. Obviously, we are hoping to get uh, a better signal here uh, back out live to Buckingham Palace. Maybe we can just uh, get Saad's audio if we could, but uh, he has been following this. He was inside the palace uh, upon the news when it broke. And of course, uh, many staffers there at the palace putting on the gate there, uh, the bulletin, the news uh, as it happened. And so we have a lot of live now looks uh, in and around the UK, not only there outside of Buckingham Palace, but also outside of Balmoral Castle, the gates there uh, as the family, Prince Charles and Camilla, his sons, her grandsons, William and Harry were there, also the rest of Queen Elizabeth II's children, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, Edward and Andrew uh, as well. So we're going to work on hopefully getting Saad Salman back. If not, we have many other guests that are going to be joining us here to uh, go over the incredible and long life uh, of Queen Elizabeth II here. So you can see it looks like this is a live picture. The gates opening there at Balmoral looks like some vehicles are, are entering into the complex. Not entirely sure. Uh, no doubt uh, they will have to bring uh, the coffin back to London. And so maybe that is what is happening there with these vehicles. Uh, we've been getting so much, so much reaction. Uh, and so keep with us here on Live Now from Fox. Uh, and we're going to be talking with multiple guests, British historians, those who have worked alongside the British royal family, those who have worked in British Parliament for prime ministers, as we uh, gather more and more reaction. Yeah, and Andrew, I want to just touch on, uh, you were remarking on uh, the Queen's coffin, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who are wondering what's going to be coming here in these next few days. So I do want to take us just to a couple different uh, live pictures as we have both of them outside of Buckingham Palace, also outside uh, of our uh, Belmore, Scotland area, where the Queen uh, did take her final uh, moments there at the castle. But uh, immediately after, we did have the Prime Minister, who was uh, just early earlier, as we had mentioned before, received by the Queen earlier here this week. Uh, she uh, had already made some statements, uh, and she will be one of those who will meet the Queen's coffin on the second day following the Queen's passing. So uh, there were a couple different uh, plans already implemented and in place if that needed to happen. Uh, we have both of them uh, right here in front of us. So uh, if her body is traveling back to London, what their first plan is going to be is to have it be on 
Operation Union. So that would be bringing her back in the coffin by train if possible. If that's not possible, uh, then they'll do Operation Overstudy. That will take its place uh, where the coffin would travel by plane instead. And as we mentioned on the third and fourth day following his uh, tour, uh, King Charles will start to tour around the United Kingdom. And it's going to be on the sixth day uh, that the Queen's coffin will remain at the Palace of Westminster for three days where the public uh, then is going to have their own opportunity to visit and pay their respects. Uh, so that will be a time when you will see probably people from all around the world gathering and uh, walking through, taking some photos of uh, her coffin there as it again will be remaining in place at uh, Palace of Westminster for three full days. Again, that's the time for the public to come and make their own, uh, uh, pay their own respects and pay a visit there. And then you have other heads of the state VIP from abroad who on day six, they're going to have a state funeral procession rehears rehearsal. And uh, then all of those other VIPs from abroad going to be arriving for the funeral. The funeral uh, will take place. It will be a day of national mourning, something the prime minister and queen had agreed upon beforehand. And uh, this funeral will take place at Westminster Abbey with a two minute uh, silence all across the UK being planned at midday. So uh, there will be a service held in St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle uh, with the queen ultimately then being buried uh, shortly after. So uh, again, a lot of uh, people uh, continuing to give us their reactions and I uh, want to continue uh, bringing in right here uh, even more guests here with us on live now from Fox. I know uh, Andrew Crafts here standing nearby but we do also have uh, some of our very own guests. We have Nicoletta who is here with us a professor of associate history at the University of Hams uh, Hampshire and uh, Nicoletta we appreciate you being on. I know you've been on standby here with us kind of all day and uh, just kind of talk about some of your first initial reaction to uh, this news here. Well, I just think it's so overwhelming. The number of people who texted or called, people are really upset. And it reminds me a little bit of that shocking death of Princess Diana. And she's 96 years old, it shouldn't be so shocking. But she has been a real source of stability during her entire reign. And so many of us don't remember a world where she wasn't the queen. And I think it has people shaken to the core. And, and you think about, uh, as we've been kind of pointing out too, the Queen uh, just days ago had been, uh, you know, meeting with uh, some of the others who are, are also uh, helping, you know, lead the country. Uh, so she had met with Boris Johnson as he handed in his resignation. She met with the new prime minister. It really shows her strength that she has shown throughout her entire reign. Uh, she definitely was a person who, uh, for the past 70 years, worked each and every single day, I would say. I think that's exactly right. Um, on Tuesday, she met Liz Truss, the, her 15th prime minister. She started with Winston Churchill. And then on Thursday, she died. I mean, talk about dying in the saddle, right? Here is somebody who um, paid attention. She read her papers. She met with prime ministers. She filled as many ceremonial functions as she could as her health failed, including making um, some very important uh, appearances at her own jubilee, her 70th anniversary of being on the throne, when we knew it was cost her health a lot to stand there um, at, at a time when she was tired, but she did it anyway. So she is somebody, she never had a retirement. She really kept going till the end and was really quite amazing as a symbol of dedication in that way. Nicoletta, it's Andrew Kraft here. Thanks for being with us. Uh, you, you've been with us uh, for a lot of these royal events, uh, for the death and funeral of Prince Philip, for the Jubilee, 70 years on the throne, and now, unfortunately, this. We're just getting a statement in from President Joe Biden, uh, and the White House just put this out. It says, in a world of constant change, she was a steadying presence and a source of comfort and pride for generations of Britons, including many who have never known their country without her. An enduring admiration for Queen Elizabeth II united people across the Commonwealth. The seven decades of her history-making reign bore witness to an age of unprecedented human advancement and the forward march of human dignity. Nicoletta, can you, if you can, talk about the special relationship between the U.S and the UK. It's so present uh, now that there is a new prime minister who has to work alongside Joe Biden. 
Uh, but you mentioned the countless prime ministers Queen Elizabeth II has worked alongside, but we can't remember the countless U.S. presidents that she has met and also worked alongside. Well, I think that's very true. And um, the special relationship is Britain's so-called special relationship with the United States, these two English-speaking great powers. And Winston Churchill invented in this idea really at the end of the Second World War. After World War II, Britain was spent financially and um, its empire was beginning to crumble and it was no longer going to be the great power it had once been. But Churchill believed that by Britain yoking itself to the United States, that prodigal son that had early on cast off the shackles of monarchy, nevertheless turned out to be this extremely loyal ally. And I think that's one of the ironies and perhaps one of the poignancies of the relationship between Britain and the United States. Um, we've seen the special relationship evoked a lot lately because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the United States and the United Kingdom have been steadfast NATO allies and have really supported um, the strong intervention on behalf of Ukraine against Russia. Liz Truss was the foreign secretary and she is very much someone who wants a close relationship with the United States in terms of foreign policy and in many other ways as well. So I think the two countries at this moment are in a position of being very close. You know, Nicoletta, uh, we are, we're learning as well, um, the news now about Charles becoming the king, he'll become Charles III. Uh, and, and Charles, I think it's safe to say, has been waiting a long time to accede to the throne. No one really knew how long he was going to get on the throne, of course, mourning the death of his mother, his father, last year. Is this going to be an abbreviated reign for King Charles, now almost King Charles III, when he accedes in his formal coronation? What is that going to look like? Well, when you think about it, Queen Elizabeth II reigned for 70 years. Charles is 73 when he's acceding to the throne. So I think by definition, it will be an abbreviated monarchy. Um, he's been waiting for this for a very, very long time. But it's also, um, I worry that Prince Charles does not have the sense of pageantry and majesty that his mother had. And I think that he is going to be um, a bit of, he was going to, I think, try to be more of a common man's prince or, or king. He uh, wants to scale things back. He doesn't want to um, layer on the glitz and the glam. But I think that the people who are in favor of the monarchy want that. They want the majesty. They want the pageantry of, of a monarchy. And I'm not sure they'll get that from Charles, who is going to try and be very sensible and businesslike. Nicoletta, I just want to read more in part from the statement put out by President Biden. He says, Queen Elizabeth II was a stateswoman of unmatched dignity and constancy who deepened the bedrock alliance between the UK and the United States. She helped make our relationship special. Uh, he goes on to say, we first met the Queen in 1982, traveling to the UK as part of a Senate delegation. Uh, but, you know, this 70-year reign was, uh, was not perfect. It was marked by many scandals, many tragedies. How did she stay above the fray? You know, you and I were speaking, I think, uh, at the time of the Jubilee, uh, where a lot of critics of the monarchy had said uh, it's, you know, a bloated bureaucracy, it takes up too much money on the taxpayer dime, it's an uh, archaic kind of uh, old-fashioned institution, possibly obsolete. Uh, and then you saw the throngs, the thousands of people who came out for the Jubilee, now the thousands of people who are coming out live there outside the gates of Buckingham Palace, kind of disabusing the critics of that notion that the monarchy uh, was obsolete. This is really um, kind of breaking down that conventional wisdom, maybe. What say you? I think that one of the things that made her so successful is that the queen took very seriously the idea that a constitutional monarch is supposed to be above party. 
So there could be all kinds of divisions in Britain. They could be labor versus the conservatives. There could be all sorts of political factionalism, just as we experience in the United States. And yet they had this um, figurehead, this queen um, who rose above it all. And regardless of what the government was, she would put on her crown and her robes and her ermine and her scepter and open parliament every, um, uh, every session saying, my government, I have instructed my government to do this or my government to do that. And it didn't matter whether the government was a labor government, a conservative government, whether she personally approved or didn't approve what they were doing, but she was above party. And I think that gave Britain something to focus on, that their state was above their politicians. The queen represented the state of the United Kingdom and that they could always see, as long as they could focus on her, that there was something um, more unifying in what she brought than the kind of divisions and divisiveness you get from um, factionalism when you have a two or a multi-party system. And she also did really help um, set, uh, cement bonds with the United States. Nearly every president met her. Uh, was they people? Um, they were invited for galas at the White House. Famously, President Kennedy and Jackie went to the White House. Um, uh, we've seen that on the Crown. And um, she uh, met Ronald Reagan. She met Donald Trump. She met Barack Obama. And uh, each and every time she has extended a gracious and welcoming hand, again, regardless of what she might think or feel politically, personally, and we never really did find that out. You know, Nicoletta, uh, we have been watching some of the uh, file video of her meeting with so many world leaders. Of course, we got the news just last week uh, upon the death of the former Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, and we were bringing on guests at that time. And you're a historian, and I asked some of them, you know, with the death of Gorbachev, now with the death of Queen Elizabeth II, is the 20th century finally over? I know that's a very uh, kind of uh, cerebral academic question, but uh, you're a historian. What say you? I think that's actually a really fascinating insight um, that, that in many ways those founding figures of the 20th century are fading and, and dying and we're losing them one at a time. But it's very interesting that Liz Truss, who, is, who just um, has become prime minister, is modeling herself on Margaret Thatcher. And so in some ways, those totemic figures of the 20th century, their legacies, um, their wisdom is actually being rehabilitated by some of the newer crowd now. And it'll be interesting uh, to see how that goes and how that works out. But you are so right that this is very much the passing of an era. Um, and we're not going to see a monarchy like this again in our lifetimes. You know, Nicoletta, I was I was just going over Twitter where the remembrances and the condolences are pouring in from countless world leaders, members of Congress, here stateside American leaders. Uh, and then I, I passed one that said uh, Queen Elizabeth II has been in power for 30 percent of America's history. America has a very short history compared to that of the United Kingdom, but that really put it into perspective. You mentioned, though, Nicoletta, the stability aspect of this. Uh, we know plans have been in place uh, for about a decade uh, upon the, the death of the monarch, but what does it do to the, I guess, collective consciousness uh, when the monarch dies? Uh, do you think people will feel unsettled? I mean, they know what's next, but they haven't been in this position for 70 years. Well, when Queen Victoria died, people felt very unsettled. She was another one who had a legendarily long reign, that there were many people at the time of her death in 1901 who had known no other monarch. She presided over the apex of empire, and um, it was destabilizing. And I think it will be uh, um, also very destabilizing to have Elizabeth um, all of a sudden no longer be there, that soothing presence, that um, august person who rose above it all. 
I think Charles has been more public with his viewpoints about thing, everything from climate change to organic gardening and things like that. People have a little bit more of a sense perhaps of where he's coming from politically. So I don't think he will be quite as able to rise above the fray of politics in the way she has. I don't think we're gonna see another one like her um, for that reason. And I think Britons are gonna feel very unsettled. I think they'll worry because Charles and Camilla are not terribly popular. And so while the queen um, really uh, pled with Britons to, to rally behind them, she's, Charles has done a lot of functions for her recently so people can get used to him. She herself anointed um, Camilla as someone she wanted to be called queen consort, where the public didn't necessarily or had for a while not wanted that. She will now be queen, queen consort. But at the same time, a monarch that isn't all that popular, that isn't that charismatic, and that doesn't carry the kind of majesty and longevity that the queen carried, is going to open up possibilities for those who are opposed to the monarchy to say, you know, is it time to just hang it all up? And I think um, it has been a source of stability and it will be unsettling for people to even think that that question is being opened up. And it couldn't be opened up as long as Queen Elizabeth was on the throne because she's just too popular. Okay, Nicoletta, we want you to, uh, to stand by here. Uh, I'm not sure how much time you have, but we're so appreciative. Uh, we'll be joining uh, with some other guests throughout the afternoon here. Uh, it's about noon on the West Coast, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and there you can see almost 8 p.m. in London, Buckingham Palace, the throngs of crowds gathering. Uh, so Nicoletta, stick around. We're gonna be bringing on some more guests. Uh, Christy, uh, this is uh, quite something uh, and a very, very historic day, a very sad day, not only for the UK, but for the world. Yeah, and you know, as you mentioned, and we do have that full statement from uh, President Joe Biden, First Lady Jill Biden, uh, Queen Elizabeth definitely meeting with a lot of uh, different uh, folks when it comes to uh, those who have led our country as well. So I do want to read out uh, more of that statement here, continue to bring you these live pictures that we have coming in here to our live now from Fox Desk, especially since uh, supporters have been just coming out in full, uh, even uh, sh showing here uh, just some different pictures of uh, some memorials popping up all around Britain. So uh, the statement from President Joe Biden again uh, saying that she was more than a monarch. She defined an era and how true is that? In a world of constant change, she was a steady presence and a source of comfort and pride for generations of Britons, including many who have never known their country without her and enduring admiration for Queen Elizabeth II united people across the Commonwealth. The seven decades of her history making reign bore witness to an age of unprecedented human Human advancement and forward march of human dignity. So some live pictures coming to you from all around the UK, giving us a look at just some of those uh, memorabilia and uh, memorials that have started to pop up here all across the country. Going to take you back out uh, to some live pictures outside of Buckingham Palace. The sun has set and uh, I'm expecting when we see these pictures going into these next days, Hundreds of thousands of people are going to be here outside of the, the palace uh, uh, laying down flowers. We've seen that before when we've had deaths of the royal family, and I'm sure it will be happening here once again, especially since they do have a 10 day plan in place uh, for the queen, again, who was born on uh, in 1926 and here in 2022 has ended her reign as queen. So live now from Fox again, we're uh, not taking any commercial breaks, continuing to bring you full coverage happening here all across the country uh, and around the world as well. And uh, gonna continue on with even more of our experts as they are giving us a little look at her uh, legacy that she has left behind. Again, there's some big shoes to fill too after 70 years. And uh, we've mentioned some of the challenges that the royal family has had to face over these years as well. Uh, they're definitely going to be uh, having uh, more challenges on these days and years ahead. And so uh, let's just bring you uh, again some of those live pictures. You can see here uh, a Britain flag uh, here and, and even flags that are at half staff all around uh, not only Britain but around the world as well. I know I saw it here 
in the United States uh, for Her Majesty the Queen. And uh, again, she uh, was the longest reigning British monarch, serving 70 years on the throne. We just celebrated her jubilee here in 2022 and will continue to celebrate her life and legacy. And uh, bringing back in here with us, uh, live now from Fox's Andrew Kraft. Andrew, we're uh, continuing to always uh, bring in more experts uh, when it comes to uh, speaking on the uh, Queen's memory. And uh, definitely here today, a lot of people remembering uh, uh, just how important uh, her part played, not in Britain, but also all across the world. Yeah, Christy, it's been just uh, really overwhelming, like Nicoletta Gulache, who just joined us, was saying. Uh, and, and so we, we've been saying all morning that, uh, you know, the country there uh, and the world knew this was coming, but they're still uh, in, in shock that it actually has transpired. Uh, and so, so many now are going to be uh, thinking about their memories uh, of, of not necessarily knowing the queen. So many, uh, you know, maybe caught a glimpse of her or, or, or got to, you know, touch her hand as she was in one of these parades uh, in her 70 years uh, of rule here. But uh, we're now at uh, noon here on the West Coast, 3 p.m. Eastern there, uh, 8 p.m. in London as uh, the country there uh, in the thousands are coming out to Buckingham Palace. We've been seeing kind of some vehicles go in and out uh, of the gates there in Scotland up at Balmoral where the Queen died, where she was uh, surrounded by her family members, her four children, uh, her grandchildren, Prince William, Prince Harry, uh, were by her bedside. Uh, and so this was all really unfolding this morning. The, uh, the statement put out by Buckingham Palace today said that essentially uh, her health was in a, a serious condition, that she was resting comfortably uh, and then about five or six hours later uh, the tweet came out and the statement came out from the royal family that she had indeed passed away at the age of 96. Uh, right now we do want to uh, you know bring in some more guests uh, talk with some some more experts uh, this here I, I think we're being joined by Niall Gardner with the Heritage Foundation. Niall do you have us? Okay, we're going to work on getting Nile. Uh, he was joining us uh, for a lot of these big, big stories, especially coming out of the UK. He worked with former Prime Minister, the late Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Uh, so if we get him, if he hears us, uh, we're going to talk to him. But Christy, uh, we have been showing so many uh, of these live pictures outside of Buckingham Palace, outside uh, of Balmoral. And there you can see there, uh, and it's nighttime. No doubt the family is there now grieving. The, the funeral is in place. Christy, you had read some of the, the funeral arrangements, uh, the National Day of Mourning that's going to be taking place, uh, and then the funeral at St. George's Chapel uh, in Windsor. Yes, correct, Andy. You know, a lot of people had been asking what's to come here in these next few days. So uh, immediately following the Queen's death, of course, we now know uh, that Charles has taken the reins. He is now King Charles III. And uh, some people also, uh, as we were just speaking with some of our experts, uh, wondering what happens with Camilla, his wife, who he married back in 2005. Well, the royal family uh, did say uh, to Britain's people that she would not become queen, but queen consort instead, and uh, that is someone who provides camp companionship to the monarch in both the moral and practical sense, and according uh, to the British family website, uh, and in 2022, just here this year, Queen Elizabeth II did say Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, would take the title queen consort uh, when Prince Charles becomes king. That situation now has happened uh, outside the gates here in uh, Scotland. You can see things starting to uh, get dark, but uh, here, at Buckingham Palace, uh, even though it's starting to get dark, you know there will be people out here all night long. Uh, you want to say uh, paying their respects, but also celebrating the life uh, that Queen Elizabeth had left behind. And it's certainly a life that uh, was one to remember. These next 10 days uh, will definitely be uh, all focused on Queen Elizabeth II and Charles, uh, now proclaimed as king, uh, will have a very busy schedule in these upcoming days as well as uh, the prime minister. So the prime minister here on the second day uh, after the queen's death will meet the queen's coffin. As we've mentioned before, uh, the queen's coffin will either be arriving to London by a royal train or, uh, if that's not possible, be coming by plane. 
Spain instead. King Charles then starting his tour of the United Kingdom on the third and fourth day following that uh, before they do reach all the way to the 10th day. Uh, that's when they would be uh, holding the funeral for the Queen. It's going to be uh, just a few days later uh, on the sixth and seventh day after her death uh, that we will have uh, multiple people who will be uh, uh, paying their respects publicly uh, to the Queen. And it definitely will be a time when we see hundreds of thousands of people around the world joining in together to celebrate Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah, Christy, so uh, this is going to be going on uh, for several days, like you said, uh, and we have caught glimpses uh, of the Queen. Uh, she had to scale back a lot of her public duties this year uh, because uh, of her uh, really, you know, advanced age, her ill health. And then uh, many, uh, you know, watchers of, of this saw her, uh, you know, use a cane and assistance uh, to get around. We saw that during all of the uh, Jubilee celebrations uh, back in June. Uh, and so it's an extensive plan. It's been in place uh, for some time. You were kind of detailing what these funeral arrangements are going to look like, what this period of national mourning is going to look like as well. But, uh, you know, for those, and I was at the gym this morning, I was talking to people that, you know, this was possibly coming today. Uh, and a lot of younger people got a glimpse into the royal family watching uh, the very popular show, The Crown, on Netflix. Uh, and so, you know, I was speaking to some of my friends today and they said that's really, really what, you know, sparked their interest in the British royal family, uh, knowing all of the characters, knowing the, the history uh, 70 years on the throne with Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, and then, of course, with what we were talking with, with Nicoletta Gulace there, uh, about the scandals, the tragedies, uh, and so much that she has weathered, uh, and weathered quite magnificently to the point where uh, she has maintained the stability uh, of the royal family uh, to the point where uh, you can see so many still revere it as an institution. Uh, so many, you know, honor it and its staying power. Uh, and you can see uh, this is a, a tantamount example to that uh, as so many thousands of Britons come out outside the gates of Buckingham Palace to pay their respects just to get a glimpse to witness uh, and be a part of the history of this day, the passing uh, of Queen Elizabeth II at the age of 96. Yeah, and a lot of live pictures still coming in, and not only from across the pond, but also here in D.C. Uh, some uh, memorials starting to set up, uh, flowers starting to be brought uh, to the British Embassy here in D.C. Uh, and do want to continue uh, talking about that life and legacy she has left behind. Let's go ahead and play out uh, uh, just a little look back at the Queen's uh, life that she led with our very own Fox's Martha McCallum. Queen Elizabeth II was born into the Royal Windsor family on April 21, 1926. At birth, as the oldest daughter of the Duke and Duchess of York and niece to the King, no one expected that little Elizabeth Alexandra Mary would one day be the longest serving and one of the most respected rulers of Great Britain. But a love story would transform her quiet country childhood into an altogether different destiny. When Elizabeth's uncle, Prince Edward, abdicated as king to marry the American divorcee, Wallace Simpson. Elizabeth's father reluctantly took the throne, becoming King George VI in 1936, making his oldest and then 10-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, his heir to the throne. At age 14, the homeschooled princess began to take on some royal duties. Her family was an outward expression of strength and resilience as England was battered by the Blitz in World War II. In 1945, at age 18, the young princess trained as a driver and mechanic in the Women's Auxiliary Service. She and her sister Margaret later joined those celebrating VE Day on the streets of London. Like thousands of others, she also had a sweetheart in the armed forces her third cousin, Prince Philip of Greece. They were engaged to be married shortly after the princess's 21st birthday. The royal wedding held November of 1947 in London's Westminster Abbey. It brightened the gloom of those post-war years. The following year, the couple's first child, Charles, the Prince of Wales, was born. He was then followed by Princess Anne in 1950, Andrew in 1959, and Edward in 1963. 
But in 1952, while in Kenya with Prince Philip, Elizabeth learned the tragic news that her beloved father, the king, had died. In an instant, the 25-year-old became the Queen of England. At my coronation, I shall dedicate myself anew to your service. Elizabeth was to rule in a new era. Her coronation in all its splendor was the first to be broadcast on television as millions around the globe watched the transformation as it happened. In 1957, Queen Elizabeth met President Eisenhower. She would go on to meet every U.S. president during her reign except Lyndon Johnson. She often spoke of the strong and vital bond between America and the U.K. But with the 1990s came turbulent times for the royal family as the marriages of three of the Queen's children fell apart, all under the scrutiny of relentless TV coverage and tabloid headlines. Then, in 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales and mother to the princes William and Harry, was killed in a car crash in France as she was hounded by the paparazzi. At the time, the Queen was criticized for her reserved response and persuaded to make an unprecedented live broadcast. So what I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. Over time, the monarchy's reputation rebounded. In April of 2011, the queen attended Prince William's wedding to Kate Middleton as some two billion people around the world watched the ceremony. She also made a historic visit to the Republic of Ireland, the first British monarch to do so in almost a century, a step toward healing a long and painful divide. The following year, the country turned out in force to celebrate Queen Elizabeth's 60-year reign, a diamond jubilee celebration spanning four days. Thousands lined the banks of the Thames as a flotilla of a thousand boats, led by the Queen, made its way down the river. The worst of British weather tried but failed to dampen the mood, and the then 86-year-old Queen and 90-year-old Prince Philip stood side by side for the four-hour ceremony. Queen Elizabeth ended the celebrations by thanking the nation for honoring her. I will continue to treasure and draw inspiration from the countless kindnesses shown to me in this country and throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you all. In 2013, the Queen welcomed her third great-grandchild, the much-anticipated Prince George, son of William and Kate. Now, all these years later, another George is now second in line to the British throne. His younger sister, Princess Charlotte, is third. She was born in 2015, and later that year, Queen Elizabeth became Britain's longest reigning monarch, overtaking her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. In 2016, the Queen celebrated her 90th birthday. That was a four-day event, honoring the Queen's deep involvement with the armed forces and giving the nation a chance to celebrate her life. 2018, the Queen watched on as grandson Prince Harry married the American actress Meghan Markle in a ceremony that brought glamour and Hollywood royalty to the House of Windsor and led them firmly into the 21st century. But about a year later, Harry and Meghan would famously decide to leave the royal family, move to America, and give a tell-all interview to Oprah Winfrey, which caused deep divisions within the family. In 2021, the Queen's beloved husband, Prince Philip, died at the age of 99. The nation mourned with the Queen, but COVID restrictions kept the funeral small. The image of the Queen sitting masked and alone in the church became the image of a country both in mourning and in lockdown. But as she had so many times before, the Queen persevered. From an early age, Queen Elizabeth was one of the most recognized royals and recognized women in the world. Nearly a third of the planet lived in the Commonwealth that she ruled. She managed to combine the truly regal with a countrywoman's simple pleasures, and she embodied old-fashioned values of virtue, faith, and self-restraint, honoring to the very end the pledge she had made when she was just 21. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service 
and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Back out here live as the flags were lowered to half staff. That was a symbol that the Queen had passed and uh, the royal family sending out a statement shortly after, including uh, that of now King uh, Charles. So let's go ahead and read out his statement here first for you on live now from Fox as now he is uh, the king. Uh, he obviously had to take the throne right after uh, the passing of his mother. Again, the uh, royal family had said that that had happened in Scotland and of course, uh, there's so many different uh, resources of support and condolences have been pouring out since that time. But uh, at least here we want to start with uh, the reaction coming to us from Buckingham Palace, uh, sending this out saying the death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a, mo a moment of greatest sadness for me and all family uh, members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the queen was so widely held. And reaction also coming in here today uh, from our very own president, uh, President uh, Joe Biden. So let's go ahead, bring that up here for you on live now from Fox. Uh, this uh, coming from the president earlier here today, going to read out that statement uh, that was put out by the president saying Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was more than a monarch. She defined an era in a world of constant change. She was studying presence of and a source of comfort and pride for generations of Britons, including many who had have never known their country without her and enduring admiration for Queen Elizabeth II, united people across the Commonwealth, the seven decades of her history making reign bore witness to an age of unprecedented human advancement and the forward march of human dignity. She was the first British monarch to whom people all around the world could feel a personal and immediate connection, whether they heard her on the radio as a young princess, speaking to the children of the United Kingdom, or gathered around their televisions for her coronation, or watched her final Christmas speech or her uh, platinum jubilee on their phones and she in turn dedicated her whole life to their service. She supported uh, supported by her beloved Prince Philip for 73 years. Queen Elizabeth II led always with grace and unwavering commitment to duty and the incomparable power of her example. She endured the dangers and deprivations of a world war alongside the British people and rallied them during the devastation of a global pandemic to look to better days ahead. Though her dedication to her patrons, patronages and charities, she supported causes that uplifted people and expanded opportunity by showing friendship and respect to newly independent nations around the world. She elevated the cause of liberty and fostered enduring bonds that helped to strengthen the Commonwealth, which she loved so deeply, into a community to promote peace and shared values. Queen Elizabeth II was a statewoman of unmatched dignity and consistency who depend, deepened the bedrock alliance between the United Kingdom and the United States. She helped make our relationship special. We first met the Queen in 1982, traveling to the UK as part of a Senate delegation, and we were honored that she extended her hospitality to us in June of 2021 during our first overseas trip as President and First Lady where she charmed us with her wit, moved us with her kindness, and generously shared with us her wisdom. All told, she met 14 American presidents. She helped Americans commemorate both the anniversary of the founding of Jamestown and the bicentennial of our independence. And she stood in solidarity with the United States during our darkest days after 9-11, when she reminded us that grief is the price we pay for love. In years ahead, we look forward to continuing a close friendship with the King and the Queen Consort. Today, the thoughts and prayers of all people across the United States are with the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in their grief. We send our deepest condolences to the royal family who are not only mourning their queen, but their dear mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. Her legacy will loom large in the pages of British history 
and in the story of our world. That again is a statement uh, read out in full for you from the President and First Lady on the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Not the only uh, remarks to be made here after the death of Her Majesty. We did have uh, remarks also made by our Canadian uh, leader, Justin Trudeau. He made remarks just earlier here today. Let's go ahead and bring them to you here on Live Now from Fox. It is with the deepest of sorrow that we learn today of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She was our queen for almost half of Canada's existence, and she had an obvious, deep, and abiding love and affection for Canadians. She served us all with strength and wisdom for 70 years as we grew into the diverse, optimistic, responsible, ambitious and extraordinary country we are today. As her 12th Canadian Prime Minister, I'm having trouble believing that my last sit down with her was my last. I will so miss those chats. She was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful, funny, and so much more. In a complicated world, her steady grace and resolve brought comfort and strength to us all. Canada is in mourning. She was one of my favorite people in the world, and I will miss her so. Trudeau, you can hear just the emotion he has as he repeats these remarks uh, then in French. Uh, and just want to give us a live look at here at uh, the palace again, where uh, hundreds of people continue to gather outside uh, to mourn the loss of Queen Elizabeth II. I want to continue things along with more remarks made by some of these leaders around the world, including a new leader for Britain. We're going to take you out uh, to the Prime Minister, uh, Liz Truss, as she was giving remarks just earlier here today after learning about the death of her queen. We are all devastated by the news that we have just heard from Balmoral. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. Her, her life of service stretched beyond most of our living memories. In return, she was loved and admired by the people in the United Kingdom and all around the world. She has been a personal inspiration to me and to many Britons. Her devotion to duty is an example to us all. Earlier this week, at 96, she remained determined to carry out her duties as she appointed me as her 15th Prime Minister. Throughout her life, she's visited more than 100 countries and she has touched the lives of millions around the world. In the difficult days ahead, we will come together with our friends across the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and the world 
to celebrate her extraordinary lifetime of service. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today, the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty, King Charles III. With the King's family, we mourn the loss of his mother. And as we mourn, we must come together as a people to support him, to help him bear the awesome responsibility that he now carries for us all. We offer him our loyalty and devotion, just as his mother devoted so much to so many for so long. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. All right, back out live here uh, to our Buckingham Palace shots, especially as uh, we continue to see crowds gathering just outside. We knew that they would be there the moment uh, this did come down. Of course, earlier here this morning, all of us were hoping to hear better news after we had heard that there was uh, some health concerns surrounding Queen Elizabeth II. But of course, uh, shortly after uh, we had started our full live coverage, unfortunately, those flags going to half staff and to then this notice getting posted outside of the gates saying the queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The king and queen consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. So that means uh, that we are still going to continue to see more happening all across the UK, especially in these next days to come. And continuing on with our live coverage, uh, going to be bringing back in live now from Fox's Andrew Kraft. And Andrew, I know that uh, many of us, uh, while we seem shocked, shouldn't be, as we've mentioned before, since she was 96 years old and left uh, a very big and uh, loving life behind her. Yeah, I mean, Christy, though, it is just still so sad and shocking. Uh, and I keep, you know, repeating myself when I when I say that, you know, it shouldn't be shocking, kind of like what you were saying, but it, it still is. And so, you know, many uh, Britons there uh, in the UK ha have not known a life without Queen Elizabeth II in theirs. Uh, and that's kind of the common theme we've been hearing from so many uh, who have offered their condolences. Justin Trudeau, his voice breaking with emotion. You just heard Liz Truss. I mean, this is the third day on the job for her, Christy, uh, and the monarch dies. Uh, and so we've been uh, hopefully, uh, and we have that, I believe they have that live look outside the gates uh, of Balmoral still in Scotland. I'll be interested to see whether or not some of the vehicles that are going in and out, uh, of course, they have to bring the coffin back down to London. You can see a lot of people in Scotland there coming out as well. Uh, to get a glimpse of this, to, to see the history that is unfolding uh, before our eyes here. And so, you know, and then again, we, we are going to be monitoring and waiting to, to hear from the family, Christy, uh, from Prince Charles, now King Charles, soon to become King Charles III, uh, from his sons, Prince Harry and Prince William, uh, and from the rest of her children, uh, no doubt. Uh, we've been hearing from so many stateside here, Senators McConnell, Senator Schumer, President Biden, Speaker Pelosi, many members of Congress uh, taking the opportunity. Flags will be flying at half staff uh, on uh, the building of the U.S. Capitol as well, uh, which was done uh, for the last monarch back in 1952, the Queen's father, when he passed away. Uh, and so um, we are learning that President Biden, uh, his schedule is still on. He's traveling to Ohio tomorrow. Uh, but uh, this is such a moment that, uh, unfortunately, so many uh, had known that was going to be happening imminently. We got the word today that she was gravely ill. And then it all kind of um, was distilled when we heard the news that all of her family was traveling to Balmoral to be with her by her side. And so that's kind of when a lot uh, of people who watched this very, very closely uh, knew kind of the end was near. We got the statement finally just about three hours ago. Okay, um, we do have Professor Nicoletta Gulace, who is with us as well, uh, an associate professor of history at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, Nicoletta, you know, I was talking with Christy here, and we were 
We were talking about the very popular show, The Crown, on Netflix, and how many uh, in the younger generation really came to know the British royal family and the history of it through that very, very popular show. Because, you know, for 70 years, a lot of people, and I think a lot of critics of the monarchy would say, we didn't really know who Queen Elizabeth the was, was as the person, uh, not as the queen, but as the, the woman, the mother, the grandmother, uh, and the wife. What do you make of that? Did we get a glimpse via that show, that artistic intermediary of who she was? Well, I think that's a really interesting question because in some ways, the really the, the magnificent actresses that played the queen filled in the gaps for us. They interpreted her as she might have been um, it, and they used historical events that people did remember, but we don't really know. And I think it's one of the interesting things. We think we know the monarchy a lot better now because we saw the crown, but the, the, the um, palace itself always denies that the crown has any real relevance to um, their internal thinking or how things actually happened. So in some ways we've become familiar with the monarchy through a fictional work that approximates a certain amount of what they did and imagines what they might have felt. Um, but we don't really know if that gives us more insight into the queen, but it makes the public feel closer to her because we feel like we've been the fly on the wall watching that. So in some ways, perhaps the fictionalized monarchy that came out of the crown is in some ways more important to our feeling of knowledge about the crown than the inscrutable queen herself. You know, you know I was looking at Twitter as well. I, this tweet, it just really struck out to me. So King Charles will become King Charles III. Uh, Charles I was beheaded. Charles yes. II restored the monarchy back in 1660 uh, as Oliver Cromwell got in the way. So the last time a Charles was on the throne was 1685. Yeah, and I think um, Charles has generally been an inauspicious name ever since uh, the first one got his head chopped off. The restoration monarchy was also um, not uh, you know, not particularly beloved. So this is bold of Charles to go with his own name. As a monarch, he would have been allowed to choose another name if he wanted to. He could have been king somebody else, but he chose to go along with his own name and hopefully he can uh, turn things around for King Charles's. You know, Nicoletta, Camillo now becomes queen consort, uh, and the queen had kind of designated and demarcated that title on her. What does that mean for viewers who are not familiar with this, with this royal terminology, with this royal lingo? Is she queen or is she not? Well, queen consort, oh, that's a really good question. The royals, uh, the royal protocol on titles is extremely detailed, and I actually think you would need some British titles expert to be able to tell you. But what it means is that Camilla gets to be referred to as the queen, and um, and it was always considered to be an insult when they said she was not going to be allowed to be the queen. So the important thing is she is recognized as the queen consort. That means she's not a queen of the blood. She is unable to rule. Um, prince Philip was um, prince consort. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very important title, um, but it's not quite as good as, as being um, the queen itself. There is a qualification in it, I think, that people recognize, but it's better than what anybody thought she'd get after um, she and Charles married on the uh, at the time of um, you know the 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 uh, after Diana's death and at the time of the um, horrible divorce and all the rest of it. So it's a step up from where she thought she'd be, but it's not quite as good as being a queen.
And you think about, uh, too, speaking of relationships, I know uh, that we've already been having reaction come from some of our world leaders, you know, here in the United States, and a lot of them then will fly overseas uh, to attend the funeral. Any insight on who may be speaking at her funeral, sharing some of those stories of just uh, some interactions that they may have personally had with Queen Elizabeth? Um, that's very interesting. I think it's going to be a very scripted funeral. The queen herself will have had a large hand in choosing who is to speak and, and what is going to be played in terms of music. Remember how at Prince Philip's funeral, he designed the Land Rover that carried his body to, to the church. So these things, these royal funerals are in planning for a long time with the actual dead person participating in the funeral. Um, who uh, I think uh, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury will definitely um, be there. Whether she will honor some public figures and at the risk of slighting other public figures, I'm not sure. But there may be words from the prime, the, the current prime minister, um, and um, there may be words from her family. But I think it will be a very heavily religious service, um, squarely in the tradition of the Church of England, with um, music and um, other things that she's chosen. And um, it'll be uh, very interesting to see who she chooses to speak. Yeah, Nicoletta, you were just seeing, our viewers were just seeing uh, some of the mourners coming out there in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. That was outside the uh, U.K. ambassador's residence there in Embassy Row in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, I, and let's go into some more, uh, Nicoletta, of these historical parallels. We're coming up on the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks this weekend. Uh, the U.K. was so, um, you know, in incredibly there for us uh, as uh, the special relationship endured during that very, very difficult time for our country here. Uh, and I've been seeing clips uh, of the Royal Guards outside of Buckingham Palace playing the national anthem. Uh, they had a, a very, very um, somber uh, and poignant ceremony at Westminster Abbey in the wake of the 9-11 the terror attacks. Uh, and so Queen Elizabeth II at that time was leading the charge on that, being there for her friend, her special ally, the United States. It was very, very moving at the time, but also indicative of how much the relationship means. Um, yes, I, th I think you're absolutely right about that. And I think um, that the United States and Great Britain, uh, we talked earlier about the special relationship between the two countries, something that was really um, pushed by Winston Churchill, who came up with the phrase, the special relationship. And the Queen has really taken that to heart. And I think one of the ironies, of course, is that America broke away from Great Britain during the American Revolution. They were enemies in the War of 1812. But the gradually, particularly during the 20th century, as two English-speaking democracies, they've become close together. And they were allies in World War I. They were allies in World War II, and now they're allies with um, uh, during the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that NATO alliance that was um, developed as a move against communism in the post-Second World War period, uh, Britain and the United States have been incredibly important foundational members of that. The Queen's own warm regards for the United States, her generosity in hosting dinners and balls and things for presidents. And then of course her heartfelt um, uh, uh, compassion after 9-11 are all things that have made her close to our hearts. And I think that one of the things that was so interesting in the Jubilee when we cover that was how many Americans traveled to London at the most crowded time, the most expensive time, because they just wanted to be there to see the queen and to celebrate her um, 70th year on the throne. Quite ironic, considering that um, America was a revolutionary breakaway and the first of Britain's colonies to really shake off um, the shackles of imperialism. That's right, Nicoletta. I, I just want to talk about the weather. It looks like it's raining there. You can see 
the rain droplets on the camera, many now uh, with umbrellas in front of Buckingham Palace. Uh, and it's been raining on and off all day like it does in London. But there was a moment uh, outside of Buckingham Palace where the skies cleared, they became blue. And I've been seeing just this uh, incredible, incredible photos of a rainbow forming over Buckingham Palace. You know, I don't want to look too much into that, but uh, what, uh, what a moment and what, a, what timing uh, for something like that. Uh, to happen uh, upon the news of the Queen's death. It was almost happening concurrently. Uh, but you can see there so many uh, of the crowd in the thousands uh, gathering outside of Buckingham Palace. Though, Nicoletta, let's talk about the values uh, that the Queen espoused for 70 years. Duty, honor, putting those before yourself, putting your country before yourself, not seeking fame or acknowledgement or reward. Uh, but uh, a sense of grace and duty that some would argue is is on the way out. Uh, I think I, I, that's so true, Andrew. I mean, I, I think she represented all those things. And she is also emblematic of a generation. We call it the greatest generation in the United States. We think about that generation that sacrificed their lives in the Second World War dutifully and without complaint and um, to basically save democracy uh, in, in Europe. And she participated in the Second World War. She was a, a territorial um, uh, a, a soldier uh, uh, and she worked um, at home uh, to participate in the war effort as many women did at that time. And she is a connection. She is a member of the greatest generation. And so the queen exemplified that idea of duty and country and and patriotism and honor and self-sacrifice. Um, and she was very old, 96, part of a generation that we're losing. And I think that it is very apparent to all of us. And one of the reasons it's so upsetting when someone like the queen dies is because there's still our connection, as thin as that connection is becoming over time with so many deaths there are connection to a time that many people look back upon and think of as a better time, when we had better values, where we were more considerate of each other, where we were more um, generous, where patriotism wasn't sort of a dirty word. And um, now what we have is, seems to be more factional and um, uh, uh, disagreement with one another that has become so intense that in some ways, sometimes it spills over into hatred. So I think when we lose someone of that generation, a generation able to reconcile and embrace um, in a very broad way, it's extremely jarring. And I think it is interesting that I think for Americans, the queen is almost as beloved a figure as she is for many in the UK. And speaking of that beloved figure, uh, I know we kind of touched on uh, what kind of reign uh, Charles may now have in his years to come, but do you think that uh, it's uh, beneficial that he's filling this role after uh, people have been in love with the queen or does he have a bigger challenge ahead of him because of that? Well, I think he has a bigger um, challenge ahead, Christy. I think that's absolutely right. Charles and Camilla are not um, particularly beloved. They don't have any of the charismatic qualities that the queen has. Uh, they aren't beautiful. And I, I think I mentioned this another time, which is one of the things that a female royal in particular can be, do. The crowns, the gowns the um all of the rest of it we follow um kate we even follow megan despite the fact that she doesn't want to be a princess anymore well she sort of does but that i guess is a different story and it is that something about that glamour that um, um that is very attractive and uh, for a monarch to wear a crown and all these other things um is something that seems to connect us not with just the second world war but it connects us with a thousand years of history um but it translates really well in an age that is now centered around television and social media and all the rest of it and I just don't see Charles and Camilla having that telegenic quality. Charles wants to be down to earth. He wants to be more relatable. He wants a less extravagant monarchy. But I'm not sure that he could ever be 
not extravagant enough for the people who want to abolish the monarchy, nor could he really be splendid enough for the people who love the queen. So I um, am a little bit worried that he will be rocky, but I think he was the only choice to take over because the whole thing about the monarchy is it's magic. She dies, he becomes king. To just say, eh, we don't really like you, so William and Kate are going to become king and queen, they are cuter and, and get better, you know, Twitter feeds, that would break the magic. So I think it's very important that Charles do it first, and he will not stop doing it unless he abdicates or dies. So I think we're... Well, I shouldn't say we're stuck with him for a while, but I think the the monarchy is now going to have to um, trundle along a bit with a, a not particularly popular or um, charismatic monarch. Yeah, you know, Nicoletta, you, you were mentioning uh, the queen as a young woman back during World War II. There's an iconic photograph of her uh, with walking with uh, her sister, with her mother, uh, in the ruins of London uh, as uh, Buckingham Palace was a target. Uh, for the Germans, uh, almost got bombed completely. There was a fire there. So she lived through wartime. And then you talk about some who have wanted to do away with the monarchy, abolish the monarchy. Uh, one, Liz Truss, uh, also held that view once upon a time, I think back in her college days, to which she has disavowed that. And then you see her meeting the queen just on Monday as she became the next uh, prime minister. So, so that is so, so interesting. But But of course, we can't gloss over the fact that the line of succession is there, but they haven't done it in 70 years. They haven't had a coronation, they being whoever puts that on, the Church of England, the royal family, staffers at the palace. Are they going to have to get out the history books? Are they going to be a little rusty on this, or is the protocol already set in place? Well, the Queen's um, coronation was a particularly extravagant one. And I think that she herself um, understood that the country, after the austerity of um, World War II, people were rationing clothes, rationing food, things like that. And that even lasted past the war itself. She understood that they needed a party. And so it was a coronation with all the whistles of bells, one that was just especially um, dramatic. And um, Charles has said he's going to have a much simpler one, a less expensive one, and less extravagant one. And we keep reading about Kate and Will. They're moving into a cottage near Windsor, but they're not allowed to do any remodeling at the cottage, and there isn't even room for a nanny. And I mean, to me, if you're going to have a monarchy, that's kind of, I don't want a cheap, a cheap monarchy. If you're going to have a monarchy, make sure the monarchy is splendid. And I think Charles, I, I think wrongly, this is my opinion, I may, I may be proven wrong, but I think Charles wrongly thinks that if the monarchy is looked upon as being ordinary and not expensive, people will be less hostile to it. But I think there, there may be less to hate, but there'll be nothing to love. And speaking of love, I know that uh, there will be tens of thousands of people who are going to be pouring out uh, to uh, the area to pay their respects. Of course, uh, her coffin going to be uh, laying there at Buckingham Palace uh, and to then the Palace of Westminster. She'll, she'll be remaining there for a few days for the public to pay their respects. Um, uh, how important is that uh, for the public to feel involved when it comes to uh, the death of a royal family member like this? They have been involved in every step of her life. They were involved when she became the Princess of Wales. They were involved when she was married to the uh, incredibly handsome Prince Philip. They were involved at all her radio addresses. During the Second World War, she and her sister even gave a radio address to the children of London when they themselves were children, telling them to be brave and that it would be all, it would be okay and that they needed to show courage to um, give strength to the adults around them.
Um, so the, it would be extraordinary if after all the jubilees, what were the four of them, the we, the silver, the gold, the diamond, now the platinum, it would be extraordinary if the public weren't centrally involved in this funeral as well. And you can see that even on this dismal evening with all the rain, throngs are gathering outside Buckingham Palace. So I think there will be many, many, many people who will stand in line for hours upon hours upon hours to make sure they get to go and walk past her coffin as it lies in state. So I think that's going to be a very important piece of mourning for the British people. Yeah, and Nicoletta, to that point, though, uh, we had been talking and we were talking to some people in London earlier that everyone there, uh, you know, if you know someone from the United States or some other country is visiting, that's really one of the first questions they ask people when they encounter them in the UK. Have you ever seen the queen? Have you ever met the queen? Have you ever maybe touched the queen's hand as she has gone on some of these parades and public outings in her 70 years on the throne? Uh, and so I think it's safe to say that uh, if they don't have a story about the queen, they would want one. But there are so, so many people who have a story. They caught a glimpse or one of their friends got to meet her at a garden party. Uh, and so she has been a ubiquitous presence in the public's consciousness, but also so present as well. Uh, yes, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think um, for, from uh, ancient times, it was believed that the touch of the king could cure certain diseases, like particularly a skin disease called scrofula. When Charles I's head was chopped off, when they beheaded him, Oliver Cromwell was also trying to behead the idea of majesty. But the crowd gasped. And then people ran forward to dip their handkerchiefs in the blood from the decapitated king because king's blood was magic and had medicinal qualities. I think a little bit of that is retained with the queen, this idea of being in her presence, of seeing her, and certainly for the people who are invited to a garden party or one of these special events, um, which the queen is all about trying to show herself and to give access. The idea of royal patronages is that the, um, these charities and other good works can benefit because one of the, a member of the royal family comes along and that brings the media and so it brings them public attention. And the Queen has been very, very dutiful about going to the Commonwealth, that we've seen pictures of that now, to, to um, link the Commonwealth to the Crown, going to all corners of the United Kingdom to cut ribbons and to be seen. And so I think that those times when people remember, even if they didn't see her, well, she came to our town and cut the ribbon for an opening of a new orphanage or something like that, people remember that fondly. So I think she used her own mystical body, if you will, to be present in many, many places, and it helped bind people to her. Nicoletta, I want to talk about the pop culture phenomenon that she was, because she was uh, really plastered all over. Her image, her likeness was everywhere you look, not only in the UK, uh, but in so many other places, especially around the Commonwealth. She was on money. She was on bills and coins and flags and memorabilia in uh, you know, gift stores and gift shops uh, in London. Her image was everywhere. And I think it really is safe to say that she is the most or, or was the most recognizable face likeness and image in the world. Would that be too hyperbolic? What do you make of that? Um, I, I think that they, they, you're probably right. I mean, she's probably as ubiquitous as the Coke can and the Big Mac, right? And I think one of the things about the monarchy um, that I think sometimes Charles perhaps forgets, it's a billion dollar industry. And people are buying these images, they're coming over to wave flags at the Jubilee or whatever, because this queen is something special and something exciting. And um, I don't think people want an ordinary person, but, um, but the, there's something iconic about her. And even the people who look upon her as more of a meme than a, a, a source of reverence, everybody recognizes her, everyone knows who she is. And her popularity in the United Kingdom is, is astounding. It's very, very high. She is the highest rated member of the royal family.
And I think uh, something I wanted to just get maybe some of your insight on is uh, when these days are coming in uh, after uh, her death and we're seeing the royal family make some appearances out in public. Uh, we know back from uh, all of our tributes to, uh, especially since we just had the anniversary of Prince Diana's death, uh, they're really held to a different standard. Is that what we're going to be seeing once again from the royal family? I remember some of the rules were, you know, you can't be crying in public. You had to still go out and greet all of the people no matter how tragic the death may have been. But of course, in this situation, you know, uh, 96 years old, as we've been pointing out before, uh, kind of expected at some point here in these next years to come. Um, that's a really uh, a very good point. And that is also a very interesting point because those all those rules about behavior, about restraining emotion, about never, never complaining and, and, and never addressing the mean things that have been said about them. We're seeing um, uh, Harry and uh, Meghan go just full on attack on that modus operandi. They're saying that it was cruel to not allow them to show emotion or to be unhappy or to be sad. So I think we have within the royal family itself now a bifurcation about the old stoic mode uh, that the queen held it to very firmly of not showing too much emotion, um, of just making sure that she carries herself in a self-restrained manner to a kind of new idea of a more emotive royal family. And it, it's hard to, to tell where things will be. Will definitely seems to be on the stoic side of things. I'm not always sure it's clear with Charles. Charles, um, in fact, had this, this, this earth shattering divorce with Diana because he was so madly in love with Camilla. That's not an unemotional thing to do. That's not um, the path of duty over the path of love. So Charles himself may be a bit of a more an emotional guy. And the other thing is that in recent years since the death of Diana, we've seen the queen smile more and try to project a warmth more than she used to sort of during her middle ages when she really tried to look to not show emotion at all. So we've seen a little bit of a change there as well. But I think right now, it's going to be hard to imagine what the monarchy will look like without her, because she has been such an enormous presence, not just to us and the public, but to her own family. How will they govern their emotions and their self-presentation and themselves without her to rein everyone in when necessary? It will be very interesting to see from here on. And uh, I know uh, all of us will be keeping our eyes glued to uh, these next few days across the United Kingdom. Any final thoughts as we uh, prepare uh, to continue to honor her life and legacy uh, from you, Nicoletta? Uh, anything you think uh, important to mention when it comes to the life of Queen Elizabeth II? I think we should really look and see what um, what is going to happen in terms of where the Labour Party stands and where the anti-monarchists stand. Are they going to take this opportunity to try and push for an abolition of the monarchy? Are they going to give the mourning some time to settle? Are they going to make their move? And I think that all of this would look a little bit different if instead of Liz Truss, who is now a hard um, conservative, now has in her uh, middle age embraced the monarchy, if instead of her, we had somebody very far to the left, we would have had a much more difficult time. Perhaps they would have extolled the queen's personal attributes, but they might not um, have uh, um, really felt like pledging fealty to the monarchy itself. So in coming weeks, it'll be very interesting to see what turn that takes. Yeah, and of course, we always appreciate uh, your insight on all of uh, these topics, too. I know Andrew Craft and I both appreciate everything you've been uh, contributing here as we continue to uh, talk about uh, the life of Queen Elizabeth II here on the day of her passing. Thank you so much, Nicoletta, for being here with us on Live Now from Fox. Thank you very much.
And as we've mentioned before, live now from Fox, going to continue with full coverage right here for you. And Andrew, uh, what a day it has already been uh, starting early this morning when we woke up, at least on our side of the world. Uh, still, the news was that she was being tended to at her home in Scotland uh, before we finally learned that it was indeed uh, true that as she came to pass here uh, this afternoon. They'd say, though, thankfully, it was peacefully at her home. And we know that there were some immediate family members who were able to be by her side during these times, too. Yeah, Christine, we saw them kind of race there up to Balmoral uh, to be by her side. It was such an interesting question that, that you posed to Nicoletta about uh, what grieving will look like for members of the royal family now in 2022. You know, back uh, last year for Prince Philip's funeral, we did see uh, the royal family, uh, you know, emit some emotion. We, you know, we saw Prince Charles, we saw Princess Anne, uh, Prince Philip's children, uh, you know, get emotional you know back then the COVID-19 restrictions were still in place it had to be a much scaled down funeral uh, for the Duke of Edinburgh back then uh, a year and a half ago but now those COVID restrictions have been lifted and thousands are going to be coming out to pay their respects and there's going to be quite a, a large funeral that's going to be taking place uh, at St. George's Chapel uh, at Windsor Castle uh, for the death uh, of a monarch that has not happened uh, in the last 70 years Queen Elizabeth II dead today at the age of 96. We're coming up on one o'clock here on the West Coast, almost 9 p.m. there in London and the Union Jack there at half staff atop Buckingham Palace uh, as the UK and the world mourns the passing of Queen Elizabeth. So thank you again to everyone who has been watching here with us on live now from Fox Boy. We have been bringing you the best pictures from all across the, the country around the world here uh, again in London, but also bringing you pictures of other tributes that are being paid like here in the United States outside of the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. You can see flowers starting to arrive and uh, be placed around the flag. And of course, uh, we'll continue to keep an eye on all of these live pictures coming in here as well as playing out uh, more of those uh, uh, latest condolences that are being sent out by world leaders by also some of uh, the very uh, famous people who had the pleasure of meeting Queen Elizabeth II. So thank you again for being here with us on Live Now from Fox as we continue our coverage on the Queen's death. Uh, we will step away for a brief break, but don't worry, in just two minutes we'll take you out to our Fox 11 team as they remember the life of Queen Elizabeth.
from Fox, where we are always on top of the latest uh, top news stories, breaking news happening all across the country. Here today, we are mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth the second the news just coming out earlier here today for many of us here in the united states and uh, now so many people pouring out their condolences uh, making statements on the life and legacy that she has left behind uh, behind this year i just want to make note this is a live picture out of washington dc outside of the british embassy we do have live pictures still coming in outside of buckingham palace where flags were lowered at half staff earlier here today and as we're taking a look at uh, flags at half staff uh, yes indeed even here in the united states our flags also have been lowered to mourn the death of queen elizabeth after 70 years on the throne of course she has left behind many memories uh, for people to look back on let's go ahead and bring you just some more uh, into her life and into the royal family with our Fox 11 team. Thomas announcing this morning that Queen Elizabeth is under medical supervision. Doctors very concerned about her health at this point. This news comes just a day after the 96-year-old monarch canceled a meeting and was told by her medical team that she needed to rest. On Tuesday, the Queen met with the newly elected Prime Minister this morning the palace said the queen is comfortable and does remain in scotland of course adding all right guys uh, obviously this coming just from earlier here today you can see though those photos of the queen meeting with the new uh, united kingdom uh, the british prime minister there liz truss again the queen working up until the final days of her life and uh, what a life it was we've been taking a little look back on all of those different historical events that the queen has lived through and of course uh, there have been many many to look upon. Let's go ahead and bring you uh, just a little bit more with Fox's Martha McCallum as she is giving us a look inside of Queen Elizabeth's life. Queen Elizabeth II was born into the Royal Windsor family on April 21, 1926. At birth, as the oldest daughter of the Duke and Duchess of York and niece to the king, no one expected that little Elizabeth, Alexandra Mary, would one day be the longest serving and one of the most respected rulers of Great Britain. But a love story would transform her quiet country childhood into an altogether different destiny. When Elizabeth's uncle, Prince Edward, abdicated as king to marry the American divorcee, Wallace Simpson. Elizabeth's father reluctantly took the throne, becoming King George VI in 1936, making his oldest and then 10-year-old daughter Elizabeth his heir to the throne. At age 14, the homeschooled princess began to take on some royal duties. Her family was an outward expression of strength and resilience as England was battered by the Blitz in World War II. In 1945, at age 18, the young princess trained as a driver and mechanic in the Women's Auxiliary Service. She and her sister Margaret later joined those celebrating VE Day on the streets of London. Like thousands of others, she also had a sweetheart in the armed forces, her third cousin, Prince Philip of Greece. They were engaged to be married shortly after the princess's 21st birthday. The royal wedding held November of 1947 in London's Westminster Abbey. It brightened the gloom of those post-war years. The following year, the couple's first child, Charles, the Prince of Wales, was born. He was then followed by Princess Anne in 1950, Andrew in 1959, and Edward in 1963. But in 1952, while in Kenya with Prince Philip, Elizabeth learned the tragic news that her beloved father, the king, had died. In an instant, the 25-year-old became the Queen of England. At my coronation... I shall dedicate myself anew to your service. Elizabeth was to rule in a new era. Her coronation in all its splendor was the first to be broadcast on television as millions around the globe watched the transformation as it happened. In 1957, Queen Elizabeth met President Eisenhower. She would go on to meet every U.S. president during her reign except Lyndon Johnson. 
she often spoke of the strong and vital bond between America and the UK. But with the 1990s came turbulent times for the royal family as the marriages of three of the Queen's children fell apart, all under the scrutiny of relentless TV coverage and tabloid headlines. Then, in 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales and mother to the princes William and Harry, was killed in a car crash in France as she was hounded by the paparazzi. At the time, the Queen was criticized for her reserved response and persuaded to make an unprecedented live broadcast. So what I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. Over time, the monarchy's reputation rebounded. In April of 2011, the Queen attended Prince William's wedding to Kate Middleton, as some two billion people around the world watched the ceremony. She also made a historic visit to the Republic of Ireland, the first British monarch to do so in almost a century, a step toward healing a long and painful divide. The following year, the country turned out in force to celebrate Queen Elizabeth's 60-year reign, a diamond jubilee celebration spanning four days. Thousands lined the banks of the Thames as a flotilla of a thousand boats, led by the Queen, made its way down the river. The worst of British weather tried but failed to dampen the mood, and the then 86-year-old Queen and 90-year-old Prince Philip stood side by side for the four-hour ceremony. Queen Elizabeth ended the celebrations by thanking the nation for honoring her. I will continue to treasure and draw inspiration from the countless kindnesses shown to me in this country and throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you all. In 2013, the Queen welcomed her third great-grandchild, the much-anticipated Prince George, son of William and Kate. Now, all these years later, another George is now second in line to the British throne. His younger sister, Princess Charlotte, is third. She was born in 2015, and later that year, Queen Elizabeth became Britain's longest reigning monarch, overtaking her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. In 2016, the Queen celebrated her 90th birthday. That was a four-day event, honoring the Queen's deep involvement with the armed forces and giving the nation a chance to celebrate her life. 2018, the Queen watched on as grandson, Prince Harry, married the American actress Meghan Markle in a ceremony that brought glamour and Hollywood royalty to the House of Windsor and led them firmly into the 21st century. But about a year later, Harry and Meghan would famously decide to leave the royal family, move to America, and give a tell-all interview to Oprah Winfrey, which caused deep divisions within the family. In 2021, the Queen's beloved husband, Prince Philip, died at the age of 99. The nation mourned with the Queen, but COVID restrictions kept the funeral small. The image of the Queen sitting masked and alone in the church became the image of a country both in mourning and in lockdown. But as she had so many times before, the Queen persevered. From an early age, Queen Elizabeth was one of the most recognized royals and recognized women in the world. Nearly a third of the planet lived in the Commonwealth that she ruled. She managed to combine the truly regal with a countrywoman's simple pleasures, and she embodied old-fashioned values of virtue, faith, and self-restraint, honoring to the very end the pledge she had made when she was just 21. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. And thank you to Martha McCollum for bringing us that report. Uh, and now you can see uh, at this live now look outside of Buckingham Palace, people are gathered outside there. It's now nighttime in London. And again, tributes are pouring in from around the world and across the pond as people are paying their respects to Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, she has died at the age of 96. And now this means that uh, Charles, who, is, who will now reign as king, uh, again will immediately uh, 
become king. And again, we will continue to follow the latest developments. But now with the death of Queen Elizabeth, this now means that there will be an official 10 days of mourning. And there will be a number of ceremonies that will take place uh, in the aftermath of Queen Elizabeth's death. So definitely uh, a sad time there in Britain, uh, considering that Queen Elizabeth uh, was in charge and uh, in reign for 70 years. And we want to bring you some of the remarks that were made earlier today uh, from political leaders from across the world. Moments ago, we heard from Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Here is what he had to say during his emotional remarks. It is with the deepest of sorrow that we learn today of the passing of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. She was our queen for almost half of Canada's existence. And she had an obvious, deep, and abiding love and affection for Canadians. She served us all with strength and wisdom for 70 years. As we grew into the diverse, optimistic, responsible, ambitious, and extraordinary country we are today. As her 12th Canadian Prime Minister, I'm having trouble believing that my last sit-down with her was my last. I will so miss those chats. She was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful, funny, and so much more. In a complicated world. Her steady grace and resolve brought comfort and strength to us all. Canada is in mourning. She was one of my favorite people in the world and I will miss her so. C'est avec une grande tristesse que nous apprenons aujourd'hui du décès de Sa Majesté la Reine Elisabeth II. Elle était notre reine pendant presque la moitié de l'existence du Canada et elle avait une affection évidente et profonde pour tous les Canadiens. Elle nous a servi avec force et courage pendant 70 ans, pendant que nous sommes devenus le pays ambitieux, optimiste, diversifié, responsable, extra. All right, so Turtle there speaking in French, basically saying that she served for, uh, she reigned for 70 years with ambition, uh, but it's definitely a sad moment for the world. We also heard from Britain's new Prime Minister. Uh, here are her remarks from earlier today. We are all devastated by the news that we have just heard from Balmoral. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability 
and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. Her, her life of service stretched beyond most of our living memories. In return, she was loved and admired by the people in the United Kingdom and all around the world. She has been a personal inspiration to me and to many Britons. Her devotion to duty is an example to us all. Earlier this week, at 96, she remained determined to carry out her duties as she appointed me as her 15th Prime Minister. Throughout her life, she's visited more than 100 countries and she has touched the lives of millions around the world. In the difficult days ahead, we will come together with our friends across the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and the world to celebrate her extraordinary lifetime of service. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty King Charles III. With the King's family, we mourn the loss of his mother. And as we mourn, we must come together as a people to support him, to help him bear the awesome responsibility that he now carries for us all. We offer him our loyalty and devotion, just as his mother devoted so much to so many for so long. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. All right, and now we want to show you a live now look outside of the White House. Flags have been lowered at half staff uh, to honor the life of Queen Elizabeth II. Again, this comes after she died at the age of 96. She reigned for 70 years. We're going to take a short break here on Live Now from Fox. We will bring you more top stories from across the world in just two minutes.
All right, welcome back here to Life Now from Fox. We're following uh, breaking news regarding the Mar a Largo case. Uh, the DOJ has appealed the special master decision. Uh, Life Now's Andrew Kraft has more regarding this. Andrew, can you tell us what exactly does this all mean? Yeah, surely. So uh, right now we're getting some breaking news in from the Department of Justice. Uh, you're looking at video from that August 8th FBI raid at Mar-a-Lago. So this is what we're learning. The DOJ is telling Judge Eileen Cannon, uh, requesting that the judge grant a stay or delay to the special master process or they are going to appeal. So uh, they want a stay or a request for delay or they are going to appeal this decision last week that came down, remember, by Judge Eileen Cannon, granting the Trump team's request 